the thing that surprised me the most was social media. The human propensity to spend so much time and effort and attention in social media and the importance of that and how it then drives behavior was just something I didn't see to the massive extent that it is. Welcome to This is Digital, a podcast brought to you by Wes Monroe. Join us as we talk to leading experts about bringing the digital mindset to your organization. Welcome to This is Digital, a podcast about leading with digital to win in the marketplace. I'm your host, Rissa Redden, partner and chief marketing officer at West Monroe. West Monroe is a digital services firm. We are thinkers and makers who bring hands-on experience and technical know-how to get things done and to deliver lasting value. On This is Digital, we'll be talking to experts about how to go about not just doing digital, but being digital. We'll be sharing stories of digital successes and digital failures. This podcast is for business leaders like you who don't want to miss out on the opportunities digital holds. Let's start off the episode with a quick news story. It's easy to scan the headlines, but it can be harder to spot their connection to being digital. Here's the headline. $70 million in art at MoMA to be sold to extend the museum's digital reach. Recently, I was at the MoMA with my mom, and after returning home, this story was published and caught my eye. It's about the museum carving out more of their art budget for digital experiences and even digital art. That includes virtual tours of their exhibits, but also content like videos with curators and things like that. A lot of the article, which was written by Kelly Crow for the Wall Street Journal, also talks about NFTs. NFTs have exploded on the internet and have brought with them a ton of curiosity. The museum has watched NFTs from the sidelines, but being in modern art is now getting into the game. A couple of points on why I think this is interesting. First, in the past, physical spaces were constrained by in-person attendance and interactions. But the pandemic completely changed how we thought about engaging new audiences, MoMA included. A museum that could only shuffle so many people through its building every year has now had a taste of what a real digital audience reach can look like. And I think it's going to be really hard for them to ignore that opportunity as they expand. Second, as we think about the integration of physical and digital experiences, think beyond just digitizing what you already have physically. As in, MoMA is thinking beyond virtual tours of their exhibits and are thinking about creating digital exhibits of digital art. Now, I think it will be interesting to see if they come up with a physical element of that on site, either at their main campus or elsewhere throughout the country. But this kind of outside the box thinking on balancing physical and digital experiences is really compelling. These are great examples of how digital is pushing the boundaries of what we think is possible. I'll leave you with two quotes from the MoMA director. We're growing our digital audience, not losing any. So we realize we need to increase our capacity offsite and online. And we're just beginning to dream. And now for our guest segment. I'm thrilled to introduce our guest, author and former Harvard professor, John Spiokla. John, welcome to the podcast. So lovely to be here. John, please introduce yourself for our, our listeners today. Oh, sure. My background professionally started when I was a professor at Harvard Business School in the area of technology and marketing and statistics. And we're very early on in the, we're trying to look at back in the 80s and 90s on the impact of AI and digitization and so forth. And I was always curious about what was the difference between humans and machines and how do we know? And uh, so that birthed a whole career on the economics of digital, economics of symbol work. Then I joined a consulting firm that was putting that to work called Diamond Technology Partners. That was headquartered out of Chicago. That was fun. We you know, did all kinds of stuff, uh, publicly traded company. I was on the board and such, rode the dot-com wave up and down, made some good investments, some bad ones. And then uh, we sold ourselves to PricewaterhouseCoopers. So I uh, got to scale it there, do things more uh, globally and digitally, and now uh, retired from there and work at a place called Manifold uh, Advisors, uh, which is part of the Manifold Group, which is a venture holding company, basically living on both sides of the digital transformation. One is on the investment side, how do we create the disruptors? And on the other side, how do we defend the dinosaurs from the mammals? And John, what piqued your interest in digital? What was it about digital that captured your attention? Yeah, well, um, I, I went through the door of what's the difference between human thinking and machine thinking, and how do you know? And then that broadened into really, uh, without getting too fancy, like a whole worldview on how the symbolic description of reality, what I call computable reality, changes everything we do, changes how we think, 
changes uh, the economics of businesses, uh, and so forth. Just to make it a little more concrete, to give you what I, a, an idea of what I mean by that, is that if you think of the self-driving car that we have right now, the car itself was largely computable. And you know that because we had a high level of knowledge of how the car worked, the fluid dynamics, the electronics, all that good stuff. And you could actually computer model a car pretty deeply and many of its systems. However, the car's driving environment was not very digitized. And so when Google went to do the self-driving car, the first thing they did was they digitized the car's driving environment. And then we could use all the knowledge we have of physics and fluid dynamics and radar and frequencies to compute the driving environment. So we can compute the car, we can compute the driving environment, all of a sudden we have this new functionality. And I think that's the fundamental thing that's been happening since 1938 when Alan Turing and Alonzo Church separately but at the same time came up with the idea of a universal symbol machine. John, tell us, when you talk about computability, what do you mean? So something becomes computable when you have a high level of at least correlation and then causation and a high level of digitization. Okay, the self-driving car, we had a high level of knowledge of how a car drives, but we had very little digitization of the car's driving environment. And so more and more things are getting computed. Social cognition usually went from not computable, some correlations like old style marketing, broadcast marketing, things like that. I'd correlate, hey, I ran this advertisement. This is what happened to sales of razors in that category. Now we're getting close to causation. I put this message in front of John. John clicks on this and he buys this. That's much closer to causation than correlation. So that's why advertising has just completely been revamped because we've gone from correlation to causation. John, I've seen you post uh, recently quite a bit about AI. Are organizations missing out on AI? idea of AI gets way overblown. And, and as somebody who's spent a lot of time trying to define it and understand it and so forth, artificial intelligence as a definition is when vacuums collide, okay? <laughs> you can't define artificial, and you really can't define intelligence. And putting those two things together doesn't make it any more specific. So forget that for a minute. Uh, artificial intelligence as a label is very, very useful for describing a set of techniques. And that's really important because how we extend our technique portfolio is a big deal. Like when we invented statistics, everything in business changed, right? And I think the invention of statistics actually was much more important than AI will ever be. And AI rides on a bunch of statistics anyway. Uh, but if you look at if you look at business pre-statistics and post-statistics, radically different, right? Risk, planning, uh, you know, capital allocate, all that stuff. So with AI, I think that people are focused too much on technique and not enough on differential competitive advantage. That's why I like computability better. I may or may not use the technique of AI to get a computable advantage. I might use plain old statistics. I may just use better sensors. Hey, instead of predicting it, I'll just put a sensor out there like they do at um, Climate Corp, where they do satellite-based uh, crop insurance. They have a sensor on the ground and a statistical model, and then they pay based on that, and they don't have to send out a claims adjuster. Well, it doesn't have to be AI, right? It could just be statistics and a sensor. So I think people focus too much on the technique and not enough on the advantage. <laughs> John, much of your career focuses on how technology impacts companies' lives and society. What's the most surprising thing that you've observed over your career? The thing that surprised me the most was social media. And it's funny because I had studied mathematical sociology, so I understood the, um, the interplay of networks and how that mattered. But the human propensity to spend so much time and effort and attention in the social media and the importance of that and how it then drives behavior was just something I didn't see to the massive extent that it is. The dominance of the digital players, the, the fact that, you know, five of the top six most highly capitalized companies in the world are digital companies, that didn't surprise None of that surprised me. Facebook surprised me. And why do you think that people do give it so much of their attention? What's your theory? I think it's a combination of a bunch of stuff. We have a mentality in this country around behavioral rights and cognition rights and network rights that reminds me of like 13th century England for property. 
my understanding of 13th century England, I'd probably get some of this wrong, and, and any of your viewers who wants to correct me with the facts is fine, but the king basically owned everything. And you could have grazing rights, and you could have rights of way, and you know you could fish, or you could take this many deer out of the king's forest, but the king owned everything. And maybe the duke, if you know some duke helped him keep in power, right? All right. King Google, you know, Duke Facebook, or King Facebook, right? They owned everything in their digital environment. And I understand the click-through things have been defended up to the Supreme Court and all that stuff, but... That's nuts that we don't have other kinds of stuff. And why is that the case? It's because we don't have any primitives to describe property. I'm a big believer in property, that property and human rights go together. Property and the ability to trade those and, you know, and the ability to, hold, to have society protect your property rights. We're like in 13th century England. Uh, what I would like to do is, look, I would like a transaction right that says, I'm going to talk to Risa on this thing, and you, service provider, you, software provider, you don't have access to recombine that. You don't have access to my geography, where I am, what time I did it, the tone of my voice. All of those are separate rights. Just like in property, there's mineral rights, there's air rights, there's water rights, okay? Somebody had to invent those so we could dislodge them from the king, and then we could trade them in markets. And so I think the fundamental economic conception is a physical conception, not a digital conception. And do you think that that's something that will shift over time? I mean, is that where blockchain changes the game because there's greater transparency? Well, I, I believe that we need an intellectual discussion that talks about what are these primitives, hmm. okay? And there's, I think that the discussions I've read and seen so far are, are not fundamental enough. Mm -hmm. They're trying to take the old industrial model and bring it onto this and say, oh, it's too complicated. Hey, you click the, you know, you, you click the, what do they call it, the uh, shrink wrap, you know, contract, right? So forget it. So first, I think, because you can't, you can't make progress if your thinking is wrong. So first, I think we need a fundamental thing. When we have that, I think uh, that sets the stage for different parties and interests getting access to that. So let me give you a specific for instance. I think that retailers are nuts to use Amazon's AWS. They're just nuts because they are using their behavior of their customers to give those providers first in the demand chain access. So I would hope that some of the people who really, when they understand computer, computability of reality and digital, will start to say, well, wait a second. It's not in my interest. I have a lot of power, market power. It's not in my interest to have this stuff embedded in my supplier. Well, is that is that not having a true understanding of the value? Is it the, is it thinking the the way in which people are, are approaching the value chain of their business, or what what's contributing to that? What people what are aren't people seeing? Sure, I I think that there's at least two things. First of all, there's just what you said, which is that the the just now you're starting to get some executives who've been grown up in digital. But you know, I used to teach at a business school, and I still think that what we teach about digital economics and symbolic economics and the economics of symbol work is just insufficient. You know, I mean, you know, you know, for example, um, most, most understanding in economics, quality, you know, marginal cost, return on capital, all that other stuff is based on a normal distribution. Well, digital economics are not normally distributed. They're hugely skewed. If I have a few people with the right tools and the right access, I can have 10 people do the work of 10,000. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Google, Facebook looks at Google and says, I mean, Facebook has <laughs> almost 200,000 customers per employee. Think about that. I mean, that's nuts. And they look at Google and say, those, those folks are bureaucratic. You know, uh, so digital economics aren't taught, right? Symbolic economics are not taught. It is at the high end. It's... It's smart people who are trained doing a complex interdependent task and you're trying to raise the collective IQ of those people, okay? That's completely different than decomposition, standardization. And you can see it in organizations because senior executives don't let the technology group reconfigure their work. So their organizational power, they just push away. It's like, oh yes, you know, thanks John. Yeah, maybe I'll do that, maybe not, you know? And you can see it, you can see it in sales organizations, right? People don't ado adopt and the organization adapts around them. They don't talk about the fact the reason they're doing that is because they have too much organizational power to jam it on them. 
That's a long-winded answer to say, I don't think people understand, they're not taught the fundamentals of, of digital economics and symbol work, which is where most of the value in economics is going today. I think that we haven't confronted tremendous social implications of allowing the strip mining of our symbol world and our behavior world by a few corporations. Well, the traffic pattern in my town is a public good, it's not a private good, okay? But there's no discussion of that. It's assumed that, oh, thanks, Google, and, and I love the Google product, and I use it all the time, I'm not saying that. But there's no notion that, hey, you know, that's actually a public good from like a lot of different dimensions. You wrote a book, John. Could you tell us a little bit about your book? Yes, the book's called The Self-Made Billionaire Effect, How Extreme Producers Create Massive Value. I just got curious about how do people create huge amounts of value? I studied value a lot, taught business, you know, been a consultant for many years, and I get interested, okay, well, just like you look at the extremes in anything, you can learn something. So I wanted to look at these self-made billionaires. And so what we did is we profiled all the self-made billionaires we could get access to. Um, and we, there, at the time, there were about 1,400 in the world. I was surprised that the majority of billionaires are actually self-made. And uh, so you see a, you know increasing ability to, to create and hold on to value uh, very early. We looked for ones that we could profile pretty clearly from public information. And then we did a deep dive on about 200 of them. And then we got interviews with uh, about 16 individuals and then try to do an inductive study, you know, generalize, okay, what did, what did happen? Because there's a bunch of things out there about, you know, is it the first child? Is it the last child? Is it the middle child? Is it somebody who grew up poor? And we found none of those things are true. And we defined self-made billionaires taking at least 10 million and going at 100x at least. So if you start with 10 million, you had to make a billion. And what we discovered was more about habits of mind, like the kind of things that they thought about and the way they looked at the opportunity. And one of the most striking facts of the book was that four out of five of these billionaires, 80%, made their money in highly competitive contested markets, water, coffee, pizza, construction. And so when you step back and you look at that and say, okay, you can be a self-made billionaire in a mature market, that means to me that value creation and maturity is a point of view problem, not an economic reality. So to any of your listeners who are in mature markets, the reason they're not winning is they're not creative enough. Okay, that's an important thing. I'm not saying it's easy to be creative, I'm not, but it's not because there's not opportunity there. Anything can be differentiated, anything can be redesigned, as far as we can tell from the book. And then in terms of habits of mind, it really is about a combination of thinking and doing together. And we saw this both in terms of um, the majority, 60% of the self-made billionaires, we were able to identify a creative duo. Mm -hmm. And you see this in rock and roll, right? Um, yet Jagger and Richards at the Rolling Stones. I was I was wondering if that's where you were going, John. Which musician is he gonna is he gonna bring me here with this conversation? Okay, Rolling Stones, yes. I like Richards' solo stuff better than Jagger's solo stuff. Is just god awful in my opinion, but but they're obviously better together. It's also true in science. Madame Curie and her husband really work together. It's true in the arts. In many walks of life, you see this combination of what we call the producer, the person who does more of the environment setting and design, and the performer who complements that. Now, this is not thinker-doer. If you look at the work of Steve Jobs when he was working uh, first with Wozniak and then with Ivy, you look and Jobs is down in the details of the Gorilla Glass when he's doing the iPhone. But he's got the compliment of Ivy helping make it happen, making it real, coming back to him, pushing back, working together on that iPhone. You often see these combos. And what you see happening is, again, it's not thinking and doing because the, the second attribute that we, we saw, so there's that producer-performer pair. You have this empathetic imagination. So it's understanding what the needs are, but also imaginatively how I might solve them. So it's not horseless carriage, right? It's a new solution to a set of issues or imagining a new possible future. Uh, that's really important. Uh, inventive execution. So how you do it is related to what you do is related to how you do it. So what happens in a lot of big companies is people say, okay, great, you folks go think something up and then we're going to come back here and then we'll implement it in our system or we'll have somebody else implement it. We didn't see that ever work. 
because the implementers use the traditional stuff. Give you a specific example. A buddy of mine pitched a complete eco, a really genius concept around an eco hotel to a major hotel chain. And he said, that's great. You know, we've got most of that covered. We have the, we have the local menu, this, that, the other thing. But you couldn't deliver that. You couldn't deliver his concept by using their traditional procurement, their traditional manufacture, their traditional construction, and so forth. Right? Uh, they have very rational risk takers. They're more concerned about being able to play again than winning every time. And if you if you know about payoff curves in capitalism, they're they're skewed. If Bill Gates's height was his wealth, his head would hit the moon. So it's not a normally distributed game. So they know that. Um, and then they, they're really good at paying attention to things for long periods of time, but moving when the time is right. I've seen so many times, even in my own career, I've, I've done some stuff too early. I can take you through some of those, but they're painful. But being too early is just as bad as being wrong. But the other thing that corporations often do and bureaucracies often do is, okay, well, we can't do anything about it, but, but they don't have a way to pay attention to it without spending a lot of money. No, you manage to the quarter, you know, quarter end, and and it really becomes challenging to take a longer term. View. Absolutely, and and even to pay attention, even if it doesn't cost you a lot of dough. So rationally, it's like not much money, but it's like oh, that's off focus. Well, John, a question for you about the book. In the book, you talk about where people can be successful, and that a lot of the people that you talked to started their own enterprises. Yes, and I'm curious, you know, to get your perspective on that from a talent perspective. That yes. Could these companies have kept them, or or was there a way to harness their sure. amazing capacity for production? Yes. Well, I think the great the great managers and the great industrialists understand this. There's a wonderful quote from John D. Rockefeller Sr., where he says, "The ability to motivate men is a commodity that can be purchased, just like rubber or sugar, and it's the commodity for which I'll pay the highest price." Okay. Hmm. And you look at somebody like John Chambers at Cisco, okay? What did John Chambers do? He would he would fund he would, people would go outside the organization. He'd fund them through Cisco Ventures. They'd build up their company. He'd buy them back and bring them back into the company. You look at Warren Buffett. What does Warren Buffett do? He picks talent. He backs them with capital underneath Berkshire Hathaway. You look at Walt Disney. What did Walt Disney do? Walt Disney actually, he bought the land in Orlando himself and then he sold it back to the corporation, and he kept talent around that who were helping to make the park. So if you're, as an executive, you have the degrees of freedom to do it if you have the courage to use them. John, a question for you around digital. If you were to describe what digital means to somebody who was unfamiliar, somebody at Alien Lands tomorrow, how would you describe digital? The way I would describe digital is that there's a thing and then there's an information description of that thing. And digital makes the information description of that thing better, faster, cheaper, recombinable, reusable, creates new assets. We talked about in the bionic world, you create behavioral, cognitive, and network assets. Those are only available in digital. So it turbocharges symbolic descriptions of reality. And at the end of the day, symbolic descriptions of reality are the main thing that separate us from the animals. John, this has been delightful. For people that would like to stay connected to you and to follow what you're up to, where is the best place for them to go? Sure, the best place would be to go to LinkedIn because I update that pretty well. And that would just be, you know, LinkedIn slash in slash Jace I also have a personal website, Sviokla.com. And of course, the work that we do at Manifold Group is where I'm spending most of my time. So it's manifold.group. And uh, we have lots of new intellectual property uh, and thinking about computability and digitization and what it means for value creation all the time. Thank you so much for joining our podcast, This Is Digital. Thank you. Thanks for listening to This Is Digital. If you enjoyed today's show, please follow or subscribe on your preferred podcast app. And don't forget to leave us a review. For more information on This Is Digital, visit westmanroadcom slash thisisdigital.